Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, I have such a treat for you as we get to speak about consecrated life with Deacon Pierre Giorgio. He is a discalced Carmelite in the Washington province outside of Milwaukee. Thanks so much for joining us, Deacon. Oh, thank you for having me, Rhonda. It's good to be here. And thank you for the opportunity to, to share my vocation. Yeah. I mean, we're, you know, we don't get to talk to consecrated as much and definitely not discalced Carmelite. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking about all that. But first, I want to know more about you. How did you grow up? Big family, grow up Catholic. What did that look like for you? Yeah, so uh, I know every every story and every every uh, path to religious life is very different. Um, for me, you know, uh, I was I was baptized Episcopalian. Um, although my my mom and dad uh, were both raised Catholic, um, it was just sort of for, in their own lives uh, moving uh, along, and and um, eventually they they came back to the church. And you know, growing up, we always we always went to church regularly. Um, but yeah, uh, it was, it wasn't until I was about in middle school that my first, my mom had a reversion to her Catholic faith. Um, and at the time I wasn't necessarily, uh, interested in that, but I was definitely aware that it, that it had a huge impact on her. Um, and it was kind of looking back at that moment in her life that I began to kind of see how God had been moving in my life as well. Um, but growing up, uh, you know, we were, we were church going family, but, um, not, uh, we moved around a lot and, and, you know, would go to church with, you know, where the neighbors went essentially. And, and that was sort of our, um, yeah, our relationship with, with, um, the faith and whether it be Catholic or, or non-Catholic. Sure. So, um, so how then, okay. So you grow up, do you, I mean, was it public school? I was, I went to public school. Public school kid grew. I mean, Episcopalian, a public school kid. Oh my goodness! So there's more to this story. So, <laughs> so then, okay. So you you come into the faith. What time? When did you come into the faith? Then. So I actually received first communion in second grade, like everybody okay. else does, as okay. a Catholic. Uh, so it, it it was just a matter of uh, you know most of my life I don't remember being Episcopalian or anything. Like that. I just yeah. know as I was baptized in the Episcopal Church, and um, but most of my life childhood I I would I have identified myself as, as Catholic, but, um, you know, didn't have, didn't have a, a necessarily a good understanding of what it meant to be Catholic. Um, didn't understand what, what it, what it meant to, to believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. So I guess you could say I was sort of nominally, nominally Catholic, uh, or just didn't understand kind of the, the basics of, of what it meant to be Catholic for the most so, part growing up. So then when did all that change for you? So that was when I was in college. Um, I was uh, I went to a, a, a private school, a Methodist, actually in Georgetown, Texas, Southwestern University, um, and uh, I had been doing a summer internship in Houston at MD Anderson, big cancer hospital center uh, in the Texas Medical Center, um, and I was living in a dorm room at Rice University, just sort of. Uh, not really sure where my life was going, kind of feeling disappointed about, about different things that were going on in my life at that time with regard to relationships. Um, I was in a fraternity at the time, which was sort of leading me down a path that, you know, that I never thought I would be going down in terms of choices and things like that. Um, I was away from all my friends during that summer. There was nobody in the area who lived there, uh, lived near the area. So it gave me a lot of time to sort of reflect on, on the, this is after my sophomore year, I think of college. So I, reflect on the past two years of my first two years in college. Um, and, and just, you know, seeking for more, trying to, to sort of rekindle a little bit about what it meant for what I was looking for in my life, where, where I wanted to go after I graduated. Um, and also just reflecting on the choices I was making, um, you know, not being too proud of those uh, for various different reasons. And wandered into a used bookstore in Rice Village and, <laughs> and um, was just, you know, shelf surfing, I guess, the, the bookshelves and, and came across a very simple book, Catholicism for Dummies, and picked it up, kind of had this grace of, of uh, take and read like St. Augustine, <laughs> except it was Catholicism for Dummies and not, and not the Gospels. <laughs> That so. should be inspiration for everybody <laughs> who's concerned about their children staying Catholic or 
wandering away from the faith or any of that. You never know what it's going to be. Yeah. Catholic for dummies. Catholicism to, for dummies. To speak also to, to any parents out there who are maybe concerned about one, one child or another, um, it's, you know, it, it was ultimately the witness of my mom's reversion to her faith, the fact that she took her, her faith seriously that, that made me think, well, you know, not just Christianity for dummies, but Catholicism, because it was such an important part of her life. Um, and she had, you know, since, since her reversion to the faith, she had been a, a, a daily communicant, going to daily mass, uh, playing, praying the rosary, you know, statues uh, of saints in the house. I mean, all those things ultimately kind of guided me back to the church. Wow. Okay. So, so you're, you're back at the church. But there's a big jump from Catholicism for dummies, <laughs> and I want to become consecrated. Yes, yeah. And of course, that took some time, not very much time. You know, within two years, I had actually entered the seminary from that moment. Um, so it was very quick. So I, I went back to Georgetown after my summer experience in Houston and started getting involved in parish life and uh, was working it with the youth group, you know, high school students that weren't much younger than I was at the time. I think I was only 20, you know, when this all happened, um, you know, a college student hanging out at youth group as, as a volunteer was, I'm sure, a sight to see for many of those high school students. Uh, nonetheless, a fraternity, a fr like a frat guy, right? It's, it's just such a strange, I'm sure it was such a strange experience. Um, but, but began seeking out the sacraments, um, went to confession, uh, for the first time since my first communion. Uh, so I had a lot to cover, made an appointment with the priest to, to kind of get all that stuff out and, um, and then began to uh, pursue confirmation uh, ultimately. So I had to kind of start, you know, where most people kind of take care of these things growing up. I had to, I had to catch up. I had, had some catching up to do. Uh, and so that was kind of the next stage, you know, as I was finishing up my undergraduate degree uh, in college. So. <laughs> and then so this call must have, I mean, that must have been shocking to everyone in you as well when it actually happened. So what did that look like? Yeah, so I, I you know, it was, it was one of these things where, you know, God really changed my life during that summer and, and throughout the next couple of years of being in college. Uh, just, just so many, so many graces, grace upon grace, right? That, um, that really sort of was moving me in a different direction from where I, from where I, the trajectory, trajectory that I was sort of uh, tending towards, I guess. And um, I knew that I wanted to do something, you know, pretty extreme in terms of living out my faith, because I, I felt like I was sort of living sort of um, too safe in, in many regards with, with regard to how I was living my faith, even in the beginning. And um, so there was a lot of fervor uh, for me during that time. And uh, I met some excellent people. I worked at a Catholic summer camp uh, my last two years of, of college that really uh, drastically changed my life. And uh, the witnesses, that, uh, the people who I experienced, people I met, just, it was, it, for the first time, it taught me that you could be Catholic and you could, you could be cool, you could have fun, you could, you, could, uh, you know, be with your friends and, and, and really be just fully alive uh, in, in sort of a social friendship, relationships, all those things. It was, it was really big for me. Um, and so I thought I wanted to be a missionary, you know, first, maybe for a couple of years or, um, but I didn't really know, I didn't know the, the process of becoming a missionary. So I, 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 I guess I applied too late and, and uh, I wasn't, I wasn't accepted into the very, I, of course I picked the most selective, like uh, possible mission experience. It only takes like two people a year. Um, and, and so I was speaking to uh, my pastor at, at my parish in, in Austin, a very wise man. He's now a bishop. And he, he suggested, you know, have you ever thought about seminary, about becoming a priest? And that was a lot to take in, <laughs> of course. And especially when someone, someone else kind of approaches with you with it, because, you know, you see priests. I mean, I was seeing priests several times a week, you know, going to daily mass not every day, but, but a couple of times a week. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's just, uh, you kind of take for granted that these, that these men, you know, have, have a call and that, that God is, is supporting them in their, in their ministry. And that was, that was sort of a new idea for me, um, let alone that he could be calling me, me to that. Um, but the, the more after that seed was planted, uh, and it was very early on after that seed was planted, um, 
I couldn't stop thinking about it. Uh, and it, and it really did kind of, uh, spark something in me, the desire that I had to serve, the desire that I had to, to kind of maybe be a missionary. I started to see that, okay, maybe this isn't what's going to happen being a missionary. Uh, but maybe there's this opportunity. Maybe this is an opportunity that God's leading me to. And ultimately, you know, I, I, it's really kind of interesting because, um, I literally, I literally graduated from, from college, went back home to upstate New York, um, and then, and then came back into the Diocese of Austin as a seminarian, um, moved out of my fraternity house uh, at, you know, 10 a.m. Monday morning and moved into Holy Trinity Seminary in Dallas at three hours later. <laughs> so That's a different kind of fraternity, isn't it? That's a exactly, very different yeah. lifestyle going on. <laughs> truly, truly. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's how I, I, you know, and not knowing much about, about the church, about the different opportunities for, for what a vocation means, um, the different, you know, uh, the different charisms that are present in the church. I knew next to, I mean, I was a very new Catholic. I knew that I loved, I loved our Lord and I, that I wanted to serve him and I wanted to grow in, in this faith. Um, and that's, that was basically all I came to seminary with. And, and a basic literally had been confirmed uh, at that point for like 12 months, uh, 13 months or so. So it was, <laughs> but you, it was a very I quick love journey. That you, you had a feeling of living in, in a radical way for Jesus. And, yeah. and there's to me, no, I mean, there are just a few radical ways to live for Jesus. Um, and con- within and, and consecrated life is one of them. So in priesthood, you know, because even as married people, I, I mean, uh, we're, we can live our lives for Jesus. I just don't think is, is it radical? I mean, I don't know the way society is going. It's seeming a little more radical than mm. it used to. You know what I'm saying? Like right. it used to be, ever, this is what people did and got married in the church. And now, and now it's getting less and less, but I digress. So tell me then, okay, so you're at Holy Trinity Seminary, which is amazing seminary. I hear this is awesome uh, in uh, just north of Dallas. So tell me then what happened there to get you to to be in this habit? Yeah. So it was, it was actually pretty early on uh, in my process at seminary. You know, once you start to discern, once you start to pray about what, where God's leading you to, um, you know, God starts to answer those questions. He starts to answer um, that yearning in your heart in terms of where am I supposed to be? Um, and I moved around a lot as a kid. So it was, that was the question of home was always um, kind of an issue on my heart, I guess you could say, you know, so I was, I was going to school in, in Irving, Texas. And, uh, but I, my mom and dad were living in Lake Placid, New York, which couldn't be any more different from, <laughs> you know, two very different places. And, uh, and so it was, it was just something on my heart in terms of home, you know, where was I supposed to be? Um, and discerning that, uh, I, at the seminary, they give you free weekends to kind of get away, you know, to go home throughout the semester. Uh, but I really, I had, my grandmother lived in Tomball outside of Houston. Um, but I didn't really have any, you know, close place to go home to. Um, and so it was just something that was on my heart a lot. So a lot of those free weekends, I'd actually go to the Discalced Carmelite Monastery in, in Dallas, um, just to, you know, get out of the seminary, but also to, to, you know, maintain, it was either grandma's house or the fraternity house. So when I couldn't go to grandma's house, I, I couldn't go to the fraternity house. So I, I decided to go to a monastery where I could be somewhat productive with, with <laughs> my Good free choice. weekend. <laughs> Good choice. So, so you just felt more at home there or what, ha- what happened? Just uh, just started learning about charisms and these different opportunities that the church the church gives to uh, her people to to ex- to live their faith, um, and that really introduced introduced me to Saint Teresa of Avila, our foundress, to Saint John of the Cross, her collaborator in founding the Discalced Carmelite Order. Um, of course, Saint Therese. I knew about Saint Therese because my mom loves her and her statues all over the house of Saint Therese. So. Uh, it was it was just sort of falling in love with the Carmelite charism. I had this strong desire to to you know go deeper in prayer, um, and and experiencing spiritual direction. I, I it was something that I I felt that that um, maybe God was calling me to to do uh, to be a spiritual director to to kind of guide people in a life of prayer and to to teach people how to pray and 
Um, so it was really the charism and our saints that really started to draw me uh, towards maybe considering a religious vocation. Isn't that something from Catholicism 101 to feeling drawn to being a spiritual director, leading others to pray? Yeah, God moves very quickly sometimes. Other times he moves slowly, but I feel like he moves quickly with me. And in very <laughs> mysterious ways, as we know, right? I mean, right. that is is amazing. So so then how do you, um, then where did it go from there? So once you say, okay, you know, I, I want to explore this more with the Discalced Carmelites. First of all, what does Discalced mean? Yeah, so Discalced uh, was a reform movement that existed in many different orders around the 16th century, the 1500s, especially in Spain. So there was discalced Franciscans, there was um, discalced monks, discalced nuns, uh, discalced friars. Uh, and then St. Teresa uh, was a, a Carmelite. Ultimately, she was a Carmelite nun uh, living in Avila. And she had the strong desire in her heart to, to reform the order to its eremitical roots in the Holy Land when it was established during the Crusades in the 12th to 13th century. And uh, she wanted to kind of go back to those air medical roots to really, she herself had sort of a, a conversion experience as a nun. Um, you know, for the first 40 years of her life, she kind of lived as um, a, a mediocre sort of run of the mill nun and God was ultimately calling her to be a saint. And so this was what was, God put this desire in her heart to, to live more intentionally uh, a life of consecration. And that led her out of the monastery in which she was living uh, to establish a different monastery where the charism would be lived uh, more intentionally, more aromatically, uh, just sort of to, to, with a new spirit, a new, a new, um, you know, we talk about uh, new wine skins, like this, 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 uh, this regeneration, that the church is, is constantly going through because the Holy Spirit is, is with us, right? And the Holy Spirit is constantly giving us life. Uh, and, and that's what was what going on for her. Aeromedical means for everybody. So an aeromedical life is, is uh, you know, we, we talk about hermits. Um, and it wasn't that Teresa was, was wanting to be, you know, to establish a, an order of hermits um, because we're not hermits. Ultimately, we're friars um, and nuns. And the, but the aeromedical spirit with that we, with which we live is, is a life of detachment, you know, talking about um, hermit comes from the root for the same root as desert. So detachment from, from things um, that, that we become attached to throughout the course of our life to kind of withdraw from those aspects to live more intentionally uh, silence in our day um, to, to withdraw from the distractions that <laughs> in the 21st century are literally everywhere. <laughs> yes, so they are. this is, this is sort of what Teresa saw as sort of the, the necessary prerequisites to, to live a life of intentional prayer. And so as discussed Carmelites, both the friars and the nuns, we, uh, we pray silent prayer, mental prayer, two hours a day. We pray the office of the church, the liturgy of the hours, and uh, we we attend daily mass. So, with all of those all of those things, we're we're in prayer between liturgical prayer and silent prayer. We're in prayer together between four and five hours a day, um, which is is uh, aromatical in nature, right? This is a, a, a withdrawal, um, a withdrawal, uh, not necessarily a withdrawal. We're not running from the world or anything like that. We live in the world, but we're taking time away from the day to to focus on our relationship with God. Um, and this is another important aspect of, of the, the discalced Carmelite charism that we receive from St. Teresa is this aspect of friendship. Prayer is, fr prayer is friendship with Jesus. Prayer is friendship with God. Um, and to be a friend of somebody, you have to spend time with them. And that's ultimately what, what the discalced Carmelite charism, you know, in a nutshell, is all about. So what, is, uh, what brings you the most joy about being in at being a discalced Carmelite? I think it's, it's this opportunity to, you know, by living a, a prayerful life intentionally, uh, uh, this, this throughout the day, every day, you know, giving your entire life to, to this, to an orarium, meaning a schedule where you have specific time set aside for prayer and for work. Uh, it, it, it kind of, it gives you a, a, an aspect of experience that, that people are looking for. In, 
in the church today. And, you know, that's what ultimately what we, what Teresa wanted the friars to do, to share the fruits of prayer to the church so that, you know, other people could, could live this life, you know, in a, in a way, not in a consecrated way, but in an intentional way as well. Ultimately, as Catholics, we're all as baptized as, as Christians, we're all called to a relationship with God. And so by dedicating this time, by dedicating our entire lives to, to this pursuit, uh, we can share that with other people so that they can take it for themselves and incorporate it into their very busy lives. Amen to that. So, so you are a deacon. So yes. <laughs> when, God willing, will you be ordained to the priesthood if you're a transitional deacon, I imagine, right? Yeah, so it's very similar for uh, diocesan seminarians. We, uh, in my province, we spend about a year as a transitional deacon. So God willing, sometime this summer, uh, I'll be ordained a priest. Yay. Well, let us all pray for Deacon Pierre Giorgio <laughs> as he uh, journeys towards that and beyond. Um, after even ordination, you know, we need to just keep praying. And don't forget, um, everybody listening, don't forget to to pray for those men and women who are living out this radical life for Jesus as consecrated men and women. Amen. So thank you so much, Deacon Pierre Giorgio, for joining Oh, thank us you today. for the opportunity.